Hello and welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. We are here to talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today we have an interview with Edgar Wright and Christy Wilson Cairns, writers of the new film Last Night in Soho. Do you believe in ghosts? You witnessed the murder last night, but you believe this was a vision from the past. The guy that killed her is still like that. I have to stop him. Where are you going? I know what you did. I've done a lot of things. You can have to be more specific, love. You can't save me. Edgar Christie and I discussed how Edgar initially conceived of the idea, how some of Christie's personal experiences informed the script, the dangers of romanticizing nostalgia, and more. Check it out. Thank you guys for taking the time to chat with me today. I did have a chance to see the film yesterday. I really enjoyed it. Edgar, talk about the genesis of the idea for this movie. When did it first sort of pop in your head? I think it was, I've been percolating for like a decade. A lot of that was just from two sort of big inspirations, I guess, is one, just the sort of the decade itself. And that started an obsession with the 60s, you know, a decade in which I, I was not born. I was born in 1974. <laughs> started with my parents' record collection. They just had a box of like 60s records and didn't have any 70s records. It seemed like they kind of stopped buying records when me and my brother were born. <laughs> I guess it was something where you just uh, obsessed through the music first. And then this idea that maybe you'd missed out on a cooler decade, which I know a lot of people feel that about 90s kids feel that about the 80s. And I'm always like, yeah. 80s, 80s, not so great. Not so great. Not missing much. But uh, so it's interesting thing that I would sort of like feel like first through the music, then like film and like sort of art and fashion just kind of be obsessed with the decade to the point of having daydreams about being a kind of cultural time traveler about how great it would be to go back to that decade. But then the more I would have these dreams, the more it would start to nag at me that like that was a problem. Nostalgia itself, a retreat, was it a failure to deal with the present day? So that was sort of one part of it. And then the other part of it was just like having lived in London for 27 years. Soho as an area, which if you don't know, London is like a square mile right in the center of London, you know, in between like the, the theater land district and like the big shopping district. It's sort of quite an interesting area just because it's so storied, like for hundreds of years, it's been an inspiration to artists and writers because it is where like show business and the underworld sort of connect. And that was very much the case in the 60s. and. Still still there when I moved there in the 90s, sort of been gentrified away like now, mostly. But I feel it's still at midnight in Soho, kind of mm. like, a, you know, the dark version of Brigadoon starts to kind of <laughs> like appear. So it's a very sort of like interesting place in that respect. And and as as you'll see in the movie, you know, the, the, there are a lot of ghosts of the past in, in every sense. Not just like sort of in the supernatural sense, just the sort of the shadow of the 60s hangs very large over Soho and that feeling that it was like better then. But then basically the central sort of premise of the movie and the thing that kind of inspired me was the idea of um, the danger of being nostalgic and the danger of romanticizing the past and the fallacy of the phrase, the good old days, you know, the people kind of bandy around a lot in the sense that there was some decade where everything was great and nothing was bad, which is, of course, untrue. Yeah, the, the, the more decades I lived through, the more I find that to be the case. Christy, what point did you become involved in the process and what was it about this that kind of attracted you to it? Well, I mean, I became involved, I read about like, I want to see like, late 2016 Sam Mendes actually introduced Edgar and I and, and you know said that we'd get on like a house on fire and so we went for a night out in Soho just because why not and uh, we happened to be drinking opposite the strip club I used to live above and I happened <laughs> to mention that that was my old apartment and it was really loud and uh, and then that we you know we were at the bar I used to work in and all this sort of stuff and Edgar said to me he's like you know I've got an idea it's set in Soho. I, I get that you're a Soho person as well. Can we go on a sort of pub crawl to some of the dingier places and can I tell it to you? And so, you know, cut to a few gins later for me, we're in a basement bar 
And Edgar told me the entire story. And I remember just sitting there kind of like holding onto the table, like totally and utterly entranced by it. Um, Cause I'd never really, I've never heard anything like it. And he's a very, very compelling storyteller. And then about nine months after that, I got, you know, the phone call everyone dreams of where he just sort of called me up and says, do you still remember that story? I was like, yeah, I think about it literally every day I'm in Soho. And he's, do you want to write it with me? And so that was a very easy and quick yes. So I suppose I, I was Sam Mendes, what, 10%? Is that how it works? <laughs> I think he'll be all right. <laughs> what was the collaboration process like for you guys? Were you, you know, did you outline everything together? Were you handing off sections of the script? How did you guys um, make it work? Once, you know, like I had asked Christy to come and write the screenplay with me, what I had up until that point was the outline of the story. And even I think I'd broken it down into index cards, but usually index cards like the sort of like the, the 40 index cards you're supposed to have on the wall, but with, with a lot of extra like post-it notes all around. <laughs> so it started to, I remember when Christy first came into the room, I, I, I worried that it looked like I was trying to catch the Zodiac killer. <laughs> but, but then all the other thing that I did have is I had the outline, but also we had this massive tome of research because the first thing that I did when I pitched the movie to Naira Park, my producer um, and Rachel Pryor was that we hired a researcher, Lucy Pardy to sort of, you know, research every facet of the story because there was obviously a lot of darker kind of sort of strands in the movie that I wanted to kind of have some kind of real research rather than just my second or third hand stories mm -hmm. or, you know, even just the kind of the, the wicked whispers that it was something that I wanted to kind of properly research. And she sort of did an amazing amount of research on the area, including sort of testimonials from people who lived and worked there at the time and who still lived and work there now. And it was a very fascinating document, but also some of it is incredibly harrowing as well. So I had that and I had the outline and I had a lot of the songs, which I sent to Christy. So it was a sort of great kind of like jumping off point to then actually sit in a room and like go through the kind of the outline with all of this in mind. And I mean, I remember kind of I got the playlist, which I mean, is pretty much the exact playlist in the exact order that they come in in the film, apart from downtown. That was the only one that wasn't on it that we added in that first pass. And then, um, yeah, that big, that massive phone book of research. Uh, <laughs> and I remember walking into the room and it did, it did have a very, it had a very John Doe seven vibe about it. I won't lie, <laughs> but that's my aesthetic. Like all writers, that's my aesthetic. And so I felt right at home and it was just, you know, we both worked together in the room. I think the first draft took us about six weeks. There was a lot of like, you know, writing, throwing things back and forth, like sharing our deep, dark secrets, uh, the terrible things that have been said to us over the years and the, the things that stung and like, you you know, distilling them into the characters and then every so often stretching our legs around Soho. I mean, it was, it was a very like wonderful and holistic process with a lot of candy, of course. <laughs> of course. Edgar, you mentioned sort of, you know, one of the themes that the movie is playing with is sort of the danger of nostalgia. And I'm curious, you've got this incredible amount of research in the film. It feels like there's also the influence of the pop culture of the time. So it's not necessarily the real Soho of 1960 so much as a, like an amalgamation of the real Soho, the sort of Soho of pop culture memory and that you've kind of gleaned from your parents and whatnot. Can you just talk about kind of marrying all of that together? In the in the film, yeah, I mean, we did do a lot of research in terms of the the. I mean, obviously, this is where it gets into you know, kind of like sort of costume and makeup department territory. But we did do a lot of research on on the actual kind of archival stuff in terms of what it would look like. I mean, there's an element where it's obviously the main character Eloise is is going back to the sixty in her dreams. So there's some elements where. You know, if we're recreating the Café de Paris on a set, we could make it a little bit bigger than the original one just for like to, to accommodate what we want to do. I mean, the thing that also was interesting to me was like to sort of zone in on the mid 60s, because I think sort of when you have a, a lot of period films, they tend to sort of like cover like the sort of psychedelic era. And what I thought was interesting about like, like 64, 65 is that the sort of swinging 60s hadn't sort of permeated the mainstream. I mean, in in, in reality, it didn't really do that. Like when you see kind of like usually 
when you read about the 60s and you read like through own music books and you're kind of talking about the kind of the the in crowd the hippest people like the beatles and the stones and like those clubs that they went to and um taking lsd with their dentist and everything that's that's just the kind of the top one percent of cool people in in the country the rest of the the country kind of looks very sort of you know just like normal and mundane and it's interesting to me when you look at kind of footage of like guys at the time, there's that thing where kind of everybody looks like they're middle-aged. <laughs> Even the <laughs> guys in their twenties look like they're 40 because they're all chain smoking and they don't look after themselves and everybody's wearing a suit. And so it was one of the, my favorite things in the film is there's a scene where Thomason is in this strip club and she's just surrounded by like a sea of like gray middle-aged men. And that was just something to me that felt like a very striking image. I have completely forgotten your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you, you definitely talked about it. I was just curious about, you know, the sort of combining the real history of the place with the sort of imagined history that, you know, film and, that we get through film and music of the time. To speak to that, I, I think part of that is as well, is that it's sort of the premise of the movie in a way is that it's sort of the perception versus the reality. So you know, in the early half of the movie, like the sort of the, the 60s is is alluring and glamorous to Eloise. And then kind of like the darkness starts sort of seeping in like a stain. And so that was the idea is that you're kind of like, you're trying to sort of lure, like not just your main character, but the audience in mm-hmm. before kind of like the, the horror starts to sort of take hold. And that was always, it was always, that was, it was great for us to write because in those early scenes, there are like red flags as to what's coming and those things are not necessarily obvious to the characters but you know an audience can sort of see some tells of like the darkness that's to come and i think that's the thing like that's a you know that's a big part of a night out is where sort of like (laughs) some people can't kind of see something that's like sort of uh, that's looming on the horizon they just take everything at face value and are not sure. I mean, you know, like in any like night out in a big city and, and you know, there are people who are not who they say they are and who are like have ulterior motives that are not entirely clear, like from the, your first meeting. And, you know, I think what's kind of what we, we find kind of sort of tragic about the movie or like disturbs us is where once that becomes apparent, it's it's impossible for Thomas and Mackenzie's character saw to avert disaster. That was, that was a big part of the premise for us is that it's not a time travel movie in like back to the future, like Marty McFly can change the events of the future, but sort of, I guess the moral of the movie is that like, whatever you do, you cannot change the past. You cannot change what's happened. You can only like, deal with things moving forward. Christy, can you, I want to, it sounds like, you know, you lived in the area you have some similarities to Thomason's character. You know, this is a young woman who's moving into the big city for the first time. She's moving, you know, she's getting warnings from her family. She's getting creeped out by the, the first guy she meets when she gets there. Can you talk about the character, what, what it is about a character at that stage that, you know, of life where they're kind of entering this great unknown and how that sort of plays into the rest of the story? I mean, I think it's like, it's something so many people go through, whether it's like moving to university or not, but it's like when you move to a new place and you've been, you know, the kind of king of your own domain. And I remember, you know, like Ellie dancing in our bedroom, that was very much me. It still is me, but it was very much me before I moved to London and just feeling like, oh, I'm making it. I'm almost, I'm on the cusp of being like this adult version of me that I've sort of been molding and forming in my head. And then you get to the big city and you're like, oh, wow, I'm I'm really at my depth. And, I, and, you know, Ellie goes to fashion school. I went to film school and I remember turning up at film school and, and one of the things they were like that you had to do was like, you've got to show 10 minutes from one of your favorite movies. Mm-hmm. And I, I picked Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet because I think it's an absolutely blindingly good film. I, everyone else had picked very serious, like German <laughs> expressionist <laughs> films, uh, you know, French New Wave. And I remember just thinking, oh God, I don't know anything. And feeling really young and really lost and so unbelievably uncool. And um, as I got older, I realized everyone felt just pretend that you like Tartoski. That's the key. That's the key. <laughs> <laughs> but as I got older, I realized almost everybody felt tragically uncool. Um, and so it is a very universal thing. And I think, you know, 
when you're writing characters, especially characters that you want an audience to really relate to, I think you should like plumb the depths of yourself to kind of bear open those nerves. And Edgar had a very similar thing. I mean, he moved from, you know, the countryside into the big city and and went to a little art school. And it's always the same sort of thing of just feeling like massively adrift. And what I really loved about Ellie is I think all the choices she makes are choices that I would make, you know, uh, her fears are things that I'm afraid of. And that's the other thing when you're doing a horror film, right? It's like you should write something that truly terrifies you. And the thing that Ellie has to go through, you know, and dealing with like kind of toxic masculinity and, and like the persecution of women is very much, you know, something that terrifies me. So infusing all of those things, I think, gives a sense of honesty. And then, of course, you've got, you know, Edgar's great direction and, and Thomason's fantastic performance. It's so nuanced and, and vulnerable. And it just lets the audience go with her and like her. Edgar, you're someone who famously, you know, a huge cinephile programmed film houses uh, from time to time. When you have something like this, which is obviously in some senses like a love letter to, to cinema from a certain era and a certain period of time, how do you synthesize those influences into something new? You know, for you, what is that process like? Are you, you know, watching movies that you think are going to, you know, influence you somehow in making notes or is it more just sort of under the surface? I guess, I guess it's more like it's like tonally in a weird way. If there was anything where it's sort of taking inspiration from specific films, it was more actually like dramas because I, I think in a sweet, weird way, once I'd come up with the idea, it wasn't like I was watching a lot of psychological thrillers and horrors. Cause I I'd seen those. It was more that I took kind of just like inspiration, even just from contextually, from watching lots of dramas from the 60s and the sort of social dramas. And in a way, like, it's one of the things that's interesting. There's a whole sort of wave of those films about a like, young girl comes to London and it seems to be like roundly punished for having the audacity to want to be successful. <laughs> and there's a lot of those films written and, and directed by men. And I always thought it was interesting that they were sort of moralistic or sort of punitive towards the sort of characters and it felt like the old generation like slapping the wrist of the younger generation so there was that element to it i think other stuff it's just finding sort of like you know just a like new sort of tone to it like it's funny somebody emailed i can't talk about the bit because it's right at the end of the movie there's moments in the in the film where sort of it's like a musical and in in frequently in set pieces and that's something that i I like the idea of doing that it, even in like a psychological thriller or like horror film. Like that is exciting to me. I think when I first talked to like you about it, Christy, I said, imagine like a sort of horror version of Baby Driver. You know, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that because I thought like that, that was sort of like what I was going for in some places. I can't talk about the specific bit, but like somebody like messaged me to say like, uh, oh, I don't know how to talk about it without spoiling it. But um <laughs> Anyway, it's just something that I, I found that idea interesting of, of taking sort of like the feeling that I get from certain films and trying to synthesize it into something new. And in some cases, it's like there is films that you don't get this so much in these days. But I feel like even if you talk about films by like Mario Bava or Brian De Palma or Dario Argento, but you look at who influenced them, they're sort of influenced by like Alfred Hitchcock and Michael Powell and, and Emmerich Pressburger. And so as well as like sort of, I, I kind of kept going backwards to sort of see the films that influenced them and, and, and re-watch all of those. And one of the things that did inspire this is I really love where films can sort of get so expressionistic and sort of take place in, in sort of their own like movie logic and physics that they become operatic. It's not sort of operating as like a realistic film that it's not completely naturalistic. It is like sort of like fully operatic. And one great example of this would be like the film Black Narcissus, whereas the movie goes on and it's about, you know, if you've ever seen that film, it's about nuns in a mysterious convent that used to be a harem. And they don't know at the end of the movie where whether like the ghosts of the harem are haunt haunting them or they just have altitude sickness because they're <laughs> up in the Himalayas. And it never, it's never made clear and you don't have to. The point is, sure. is that by the end of the movie, everybody is going out of their mind. And also the way Michael Powell directs it is like the colors are starting to become more and more surreal and expressionistic. And so I sort of took my cue from things like that, where I felt like there's a sort of point in the movie without giving too much away where Thomas and McKenzie not only has a supernatural gift, but she's also like massively sleep deprived for like the last <laughs> half of the movie. And if you've ever had that thing where, 
Oh, yeah. I've been up for 48 hours. <laughs> but like, so at a certain point, everything has gone crazy. And even like, so it just, I wanted to, the film to sort of end in that kind of like manic state where like you're not quite sure what's real and what's not, but also like everything is like heightened to sort of an operatic level. Just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Christy, I just, I'm going to take a kind of left turn here. I'm just curious. When did you first know you want you were going to be a, a storyteller, a writer? Oh, I mean, kind of late. I, I loved film and TV growing up. And I grew up in Scotland where it rains all the time. So you spend a lot of times indoor in front of the TV. Uh, and I never had any idea that they were made. Like they were just like, there was like a portal in my living room that showed me other worlds. And I had no concept of like, there was a director, there was a writer, there were actors. I was just like transported and living. And I when I was about 14... I walked past a film set in Scotland and they were shooting a, a TV series called Tiger. And someone said, oh, there's a film set down there. And I was like, I have to see this. It was like my mecca. And, and then it was just a bunch of white vans gathered around. And I just, <laughs> I instantly infiltrated it and started asking questions. And to their massive credit, that crew and that cast really kind of just let me in there and ask all these questions. And I went back every day of the summer holiday. And eventually they said, you know what, if you're going to keep turning up here, we'll have to hire you. Otherwise you're a liability <laughs> risk. <laughs> so they hired me as a like, you know, coffee person. I couldn't even drive. I was useless. I didn't, I still don't make good coffee, <laughs> but I got such an education on set. And so for years, I, I just wanted to work in the film industry. And I did that all through my like last few years at school. And then, and then I did my degree in filmmaking and on that degree, my, my undergraduate, I met the writer, Richard Smith, who actually came and saw it the other night. And I introduced him to Edgar. He's my writing dad. Mm -hmm. And he, he read a short story that I'd written and he said, Oh, stop, stop your search. This is what you should do. <laughs> and I remember really not wanting to write. Like I remember thinking, oh, I've come to film school to make films and to be on set and with a camera. And I don't want to write essays. And then the minute I sat down to start writing scripts, it just clicked. Uh, and I loved it. And yeah, so I, I had really good lectures, like a really supportive mother who's like massively pushed me forward. And I got really lucky breaks. But yeah, just started loving film. <laughs> That's awesome. And Ed, Edgar, you started at a young age, correct? Making short films and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, is that I, you know, when I was making like amateur films, I started when I was 14. So my parents like bought me and my brother a secondhand Super 8 camera. It was one of those presents that went over, you know, like sometimes you have a joint birthday and Christmas present, that it was like a joint birthday and Christmas present for me and my brother. So it was essentially covering four <laughs> events, so, um, but we were very happy to have it. And we started making like goofy shorts and stuff. And that's, I just sort of continued doing that through art college and and then, you know, I made a film when I was 20, a very low budget, silly film that only had one draft. It didn't <laughs> occur to me to write a second draft for the screenplay. <laughs> I think so. Sort of then when I was working in TV, I was, I was mostly directing and sometimes doing script editing and doing some writing. I never used to think of myself as a writer. I was always like just writing to direct to, you know, and then it wasn't really until like after Spaced when me and Simon decided to write Shaun of the Dead was because we both wanted to do a film and we'd been reading things, the few things that we'd been sent. And there was that feeling. I, at that point, I would never have described myself as a writer director. I would always be, I'm a, I want to be a director. I'm a director. But it was the point when the reason we wrote Sean was that we came to that point where we'd been reading other scripts and thinking we could write something better than this. So in a weird way, writing Shaun of the Dead was sort of out of necessity. We wanted to make a film together, but we knew that if we wrote it together, it would be better than anything that would come through our letterbox. That, I, don't, I don't know if that sounds cocky. It doesn't, I don't mean to, but it was just something where it was almost like writing as a necessity. And I, I guess it sort of continued in a strange way where I have these ideas in my head. And at a certain point, I know that I'm the only person who can do it. Then also I say, I, I have to get Christy Wilson Cairns to help me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that makes sense. Um, last question before you guys go. And if we can answer from each of you, that'd be great. Christy, you first. Is there something that you've learned over the course of your career that as a writer, you wish you knew when you were first starting out? Oh, yeah. I mean, the most kind of thing, and I learned this, and I really learned this on every every new job, is that you can just let the actors act um, and the director <laughs> get those performances. Sometimes you think, oh, oh, I need to make sure I've got all that down in dialogue. I need to make sure that points across. And, you know, in the rehearsals for this, you know, sometimes you, I'd have written a load of lines and then Anya or Thomason or Matt or Diana would just do it with a look. And I'm like, oh, God, that's so much more efficient. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let the actors act. Trust them. 
Trust your collaborators. Oh, and Edgar, what about you? Well, it's funny. There's a similar night. I think so. What happens is that with development, sometimes like a studio wants to see every single like emotion reflected in dialogue. And I, I, I think it's like one of the reasons that I wrote Baby Driver is because I was sort of very aware that my previous movies had done well in English language territories and like nowhere else. Whenever they were dubbed or if you, they were like in a subtitle, it just wouldn't do as well. One of the things I, I you know, like I wish I could embrace a bit more um, and would like to is to sort of just lean on visual storytelling more. It is a thing where that when you're writing a script with a studio, people just want to see like everything written. And the truth is it doesn't have to be. That's something that I, I kind of like would go back and sort of try and do more of that, I guess. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to chat and congrats on the film. And the uh, I saw the premiere last night at the Academy. It looked like it was a lot of fun. So I, I wish you guys the best. Thank uh, you very thanks much. Thanks very much. Thanks again to Edgar and Christy for coming on the show. Last Night in Soho is in theaters right now. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about new episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and on Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This podcast was produced by Kayla Guess and co-produced by Emma Vranich. Editing is by Sean Bonnet. Music is by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Mm-hmm.